other factors. And also, to move to the future, we need to unpack the present. We need to critically engage with it, trying to understand it and move to the future. So with this session, uh, we will start with a keynote speaker, a storyteller and an activist. And then we will move to a panel discussion with four experts. Yes, so uh, talking about past and present at the beginning of the session as well, I'm not sure if you remember, we asked a poll question to the audience. We will show the response right before the panel, so we invite you to make sure within five minutes to answer the, the question, then we'll also display the poll question for the present. So there will be past and present, and we'll just have a look a bit at the results. Without further ado, uh, it is a great honor for me to present to you the upcoming keynote speaker, Wa'ad Al Khatib. Thank you, Wa'ad, for being with us, and thank you also for all the speakers who are with us. Wa'ad will share her story much more into details. However, please allow me to give you a little bit of a brief overview of her background. Wa'ad is a multi-award multi winning filmmaker and activist from Aleppo. She's most famous for her feature documentary for Sama, released in 2019, which trailer we will be also showing you shortly. As she began to report the conflict in Syria and one of the most complex humanitarian class crisis in the world for Channel 4 News in the UK at the onset of the war in 2011, her reports became the most watched pieces at national level, receiving almost half a billion views online and winning 24 awards. During this time, Wa'ad taught herself how to film and became a citizen journalist, determined to document the horrors of the war. This footage became the foundation of the feature documentary and won multiple awards, including Le Prix L'Oeil d'Or for the best documentary at the 2019 Cannes Film Festival, where she also received a six-minute standing ovation. At the 73rd British Academy Film Awards in 2020, Fursama became the most nominated documentary in the history of the BAFTAs, with four nominations ultimately winning for Best Documentary. In 2020, she was recognized in the time 100 list of most influential people. Today, through her Action for Sama campaign, Wad focuses on utilizing storytelling as a unique educational tool to build more empathetic responses to the situation in Syria, pursuing accountability for the perpetrators of war crimes as conducted through the targeting of civilians and hospitals. Wad is one of the key change makers from the region who to this day managed to reclaim her narrative and tell her story to the world in the most powerful form with the hope to change it and to change those of others in the same situation. Please join me in welcoming Wad warmly. Thank you so much, Melanie and Odile, for this introduction. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to see so many people who I really like feel very supportive. And uh, I have a great experience uh, with side scholarship. Um, I am um, a scholarship holder. Um, I didn't finish yet, uh, but I will soon, hopefully. Um, I would love to start with the, the trailer. Um, and I just want to say a couple of words about the trailer, which for me and the film itself is not uh, a film. Um, it's my life, and it's the life of so many Syrians. It's the, the life who's, who so, of so many people who are still living until today in that circumstances. Um, I did this film because I really wanted people to understand what we've been through. And I really feel the present, which is now, it's a lot about what happened in Syria since 2011, but also a lot about before. Um, so I will leave you first with the trailer. And I really would love you to open your eyes and your heart as you're watching this. And I encourage you all, anyone who have not seen the film, please like do. Um, this is the trailer. Bihalab, Madinti. I'm going to Come on. 
sama سما عملت هالفيلم مشانك بدي اياك تفهم شو اللي كنا عم نقاتل مشانه في ضرب كثير اليوم سما انا بعرف انك عم تفهمي شو عم بصير بقدر شوف هالشي بعيونك ما عم تبكي مثل اي طفل عادي هذا الشيء اللي عم يحرق قلبي سما رح تسامحيني Thank you so much. Um, to understand a lot where we are today, I think we have to go back all 11 years ago. I am a student at Aleppo University, normal student. I was actually doing well, although marketing was not my dream and was not my first choice. I always wanted to be a journalist. Shirin Abu Akhle, who was killed by the uh, Israeli uh, forces, and Jivar al um two uh, Palestinian journalists. They were my role model when I was young. And I wanted always to be a journalist, just to be like them. My parents were very worried about me, and they were always saying, like, you can't be a journalist in Syria, because the, the minute you will be, you're going to be in jail. I had a nice life, good friends, and I am doing like a German course to be able to go to Germany after finishing my university um, and be ready to do a master's degree and probably never come back. That's how I see my life. And what we feel underneath that, there's no hope, no future for our country. And the only future visible for me was outside of Syria. Months later, revolutions are happening. Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. There is hope. I can feel it. But what about us in Syria? Do we dare to stand against the corruption, injustice, and oppression for the, of the past 40 years? Do we dare to chant freedom? It is happening. There are Damascus, Homs, and so many other cities. It's even happening in my university. I'm going now to university every day, waiting and waiting. I'm no longer attending any classes. I don't care. I just want to witness this moment. I can hear something echoing in the pa I can hear something echoing in the distance. I am at the courtyard of my college. Am I dreaming? Is it one of those pro Assad shows that the government used to arrange? Why are some people running away from the sound? I want to see. My legs are running toward it. I can't stop myself. Yes, it is. Around 20 students chanting, freedom, freedom. I'm trying to say it. I can't. Why am I frozen in my place? Maybe because I can't believe it. Like a raging bulls, from nowhere, security forces are attacking and beating the protesters. Running around, escaping, a lot of chaos ends this beautiful scene. Like nothing happened. But will it never happen again? The next day, 
those 20 students turn into 50. I am one of them. Ma fil al abad, ma fil al abad, ashat Suriya, we escort al Assad. Nothing lasts forever, nothing lasts forever. Long live Syria, down with Assad. From that moment, everything has changed. Everywhere in Syria, there was revolution, and also so many brutality against it. What stuck in my mind from these videos that were publishing everywhere. In Dara, the army dragged a man, a father, out onto the street and beat him in front of everyone. That video was filmed by a neighbor. In Banyas, in the west of Syria, the same army gathered up the men and boys in an Al 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 village and held them face down, forced to the ground, under the weight of the soldiers' boots. This video encouraged us as activists to pick up our phones and start filming. Such scenes were everywhere. People gathered to, together around the statue of Assad's father trying to pull it down together. Over millions of protesters were in al Asi Square in Hama. Hundreds gathered around the clock in Homs and thousands of students joined the protests at Aleppo University. But five years later, I am in the basement of a makeshift hospital in Aleppo, where my husband Hamza is a doctor, working with the other doctors, nurses, and volunteers. We have our baby Sama. She's only nine months old. I have my camera, and I have filmed every day since I was at university. Wearing a scarf is not something I believe in, although I do respect it. The security emerging in my local area was one reason I started wearing a scarf at the beginning. But then it was because something I was forced to keep doing due to the facto authority. I know it wasn't right to ignore this battle, but for so many reasons, I just was not able to fight it. We are besieged by Assad's army, Russian forces, Iranian militia, and Hezbollah thugs. They have been targeting us with mortars, barrel bombs, aircraft strikes, cluster bombs, rockets, white phosphors, and chlorine gas. They prevented us from getting food, medicine, and any help. I forget what a tomato smells and tastes like. I found out I'm pregnant again and it was very shocking. It's hard to take responsibility for this child. It is scary, but also it was really beautiful. How can I protect them? How can I feed Sama? How can I even feed myself? What to do without nappies? How to get vitamins and, or medicine if they are sick? So many questions continue to disturb me every day. But these thoughts disappear, especially when I hear the sound of the emergency car bringing injured people to the hospital. I have to go down and film. I leave all my fears behind. And the man I love, I only see him in the ER room, covered with blood, barely sleeping during the night. But with all of this, he always smiles. From the first day we met at university, even before I fell in love with him, his magical smile was there. His smile, along with the love of Aleppo, what makes me go. Another five years, and another year, and this is me today. I live in London now. I have turned 30. I have mixed thought and feelings the usual I have that I tur I'm turning my back on the people of Syria. It is hard. We are trying to do everything we can, but I still feel like I have turned away just because I'm no longer there. Why did I survive? Why haven't we felt happy to survive? These questions 
still keep me up at night every day. It is frustrating to be raising my two kids in exile and they don't even know what my home in Syria look like. While the regime is roaming around my country in heavy military vehicles, committing crimes under the eyes of the international community and every one of us here. It's been 11 years and yes, we lost a lot. And what we are fighting with now is the last thing we own. It's us, the story, our side of the story, the truth. This story is not only Aleppo's story. Over the past 10 years, different parts of Syria endured more than 222 chemical attacks. Ghouta endured a five years long suffocating siege. More than 610 attacks on health facilities, attacks on school, bakeries, white helmet centers, and civilians' neighborhoods. We lost more than 230,000 people, of whom at least 930 were medical professionals. At least 150,000 people are still detained, mostly by the Syrian regime forces. These are not just numbers. Each one of them represents a story and a life. This is something we can't move on from. It's something we don't want to move on from. Because we owe it to all of these people to keep fighting at least in the shape of preserving memory for Sama, for Aleppo, for Syria, for the future of us. This revolution is a way of no return. Every revolution is like that. I still believe every word we chanted. I still feel the same passion I had when I was at university and I start chanting the first time freedom. We cannot give up. We have to keep looking back and keep telling this story, keep telling the truth. We need to make our voices as loud as it was in 2011. Each one of us has a story and you have to keep telling the story. We survive to live, to raise the name of a free Syria everywhere we go and to honor the people we lost on the Freedom Way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Wahad, for sharing with us this personal story. It's a story of hope, it's a story of love, it's a story of resistance. There are a lot of things you, you touched on, from the survival guilt to traumas, to home, to belonging. Things I would like really to spend maybe the whole day to unpack with you. Um, we have around 12, 13 minutes, and uh, we would like to give the chance to the audience, but maybe me and Melini can ask you very two quick one. And um, I, I will start uh, with a question. Um, when I looked at the, at the, at the movie, um, one of the things that come to my mind that what you did, from your, from your point of view, this will last with you forever. This movie will be there forever. Is this good or bad? Because sometimes we want to disconnect from our traumas. We want to disconnect from our past. We want to move on and flip the page and live for ourselves rather than for a bigger cause. And this is fine, that means we are at the bottom and we need to, to have the self-care. But you having this story will be there forever. Is this good or bad for you that the story is there forever? I mean, like, I think we always have so many questions about what we've done and what we could have done before and is that right or wrong and all of this. The only thing I do not regret at all and I still feel like the best thing happened in my life was being like one of the Syrian people who were like protesting the revolution itself. And for me, like this story and how it started is something like I really want to keep forever. And I think it's not only about Syria, it's about the whole region and area. It's about even being here in the UK now. Um, I have some questions sometimes about, like, is this something maybe for Sama and Taima? Like, Sama's name now is in the film. Whenever, wherever she went, 
However, like she wanted her life to be, she will always be attached to this at the beginning. And maybe something like, I question myself a little bit, is this too much for her? Um, but for me, like personally, I'm, I'm, I don't regret that, no, at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Wild. Thank you so much for this very touching moment. It was really difficult not to have tears falling as well, and it was really emotional, and it's the reality of many people that we tend to forget. And I think I highly encourage people to submit their questions. Um, and in the meantime, I was thinking as well, we're talking about narrative, present, pr past, and future. And oftentimes, the narrative is dominated by media outlets. Um, and media outlets are depending on power dynamics. And oftentimes, there's one narrative that's dominant um, which is oftentimes is a Western about the East, and it's hard not to say that it's romanticized, that the region is romanticized, um, which you also managed to, to do in, in a certain way because you, you dedicated this piece to your daughter. And do you feel that romanticizing the situation as well, is this a bad thing or a good thing, but also what are the impacts that you have until now from this movie? Because the moment you decide to do this movie, the moment it became a part of your integral identity. And how do you feel that this has impacted you in the present moment? Because there's also a lot of perception about the West that the East has to you know, topple the regime and go to protests and changes through elections, um, failing to consider the whole regional context. And people like you have managed to undertake actions but at what cost as well? And can you tell us a bit about how this translates into at the moment for you as well, and the yeah. difficulties? <clears throat> I think one of the hardest thing I had to go through when I came and when I left Syria, first in Turkey and then here, was like people coming to me and saying like, oh, congratulations, you survived. Congratulations, you left, you are okay now, you are here. And this kind of question about like, oh, how is it, does it feel weird like you are here now and what you've been through before and you know, like, just, I think the main reason why I did the film was like just to answer the congratulation question. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I was like, I wanted the people to understand that even if we are here now, we all having our own package. And there's a, like a very kind of important question about are we stuck in the past? And do we want to move on or not? And this is, I think, something we all have in different ways. But the way how I think the film helped because it's, like an hour and a half. It's a full experience. It was filmed like day by day with what we've been through. I was able just to maybe a little bit make people understand that situation. And I mean, it's really hard to, even with this film, it's only one story of like millions of Syrian people. And there's so many like more stories, which is more horror story, more even beautiful story, more hope story. But I think the main thing about how much can we tell our own stories. And it's really us, not someone else telling our stories. Um, and that's, I think, very important. I part. want to pick up on this very quickly about the story. Some people might say, Wad, why are you just depicting your story? There are a counter story. And why you're just saying the story from one side? And I'm sure you've heard this question before. And it could be a criticism or whatever. I don't know where, what the intention of people when they ask this question. But well, I'm asking it from a position just to clarify why you only portrayed your story and one side of the story. Let's say the opposition story. Um, it's not opposition story. It's okay. one girl story who was a student and became something else at the end because of everything happened in Syria. It's the story that not so many like media outlet St like they started to start talk about this at the beginning, but then it started to become more like ISIS, HTS, what's happening, the regime, and all this complication like stuff. Um, I think it's as much as you can be specific that this is a story of humanity, of civilians who were living in that area. It's the story of normal people who started or tried to do something, and then what happened later is something you, you, you're gonna see. Um, you'll never be able to tell the full story and you'll never be able to, to tell the full picture. But what I believe in that, what I've been through, what so many Syrian people have been through, is something have to be like out. And um, yeah, it's one side of the story. Of course, I'm not gonna go to uh, talk with the regime or like the aircraft 
pilot who was like dropping barrel bombs on the civilians. I won't give platform to anyone who is encouraging people to kill civilians and to Thank kill you. like anyone, not in, not in Syria, not in any other place. Thank you, Wad. Thank you so Thank much. You. We uh, got a question as well from the public. Please. Um, so someone is asking, how do you teach Sama and Taima about their Syrian heritage? Is it through art, music, and stories? I'm asking for my nieces. Yeah, I started with food. And mm, I was starts. telling Melanie yesterday, like, I'm really proud that they know so many um, Syrian males and they, they ask for that and they say, like, oh, I smell Mluchia, which for me, like, I really, I'm, mm. I'm working hard. <laughs> um, the Arabic is something really important and, like, to, be, to feel the identity and to feel they belong to. I think there's part of uh, the attempt that we're trying me and Hamza do is, like, also a little bit to protect them because we're too much into everything. And I think the conversation they pick up, the stuff they know from our wall, from what we, our work is and so many places we go to, um, is too much for a child to, to understand. But I think it's really important to not to lie to them and understand as much as we can explain from now. Of course. Did you tell them about the argument that Aleppo food is better than Damascus food? <laughs> did you, did you, did you? Not yet, but they don't know that Damascus has existed yet. Oh. Well. They only know Syria as Aleppo. I'm sorry. Not That's yet. fair enough for them. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, pe people from Damascus. I'm sorry. That's fine. That's fine. We have a thick skin. We, we, we can take criticism. Um, anyone would like to pose a question from the audience? We have Barik and we have Karam. Maybe we'll start with Barak and Karam, and I believe we need to end as yeah. well this se session. Can you please? If you have a loud like voice, please. Uh, um, okay, should we start with Karam Barak, if you don't mind? Uh, um, that's fine, let's start with Karam. Do you think you'll be back to Aleppo one day? Do I think or do I hope? Because it's different ones. Uh, okay, it's, it's really hard and I think it's a question we all have every day. I won't go through this. I would love to go back. Um, I don't know what I think. Uh, I hope to go back. I'm very honest now, I'm sorry. <laughs> But Thank you. I, uh, I haven't seen the movie. I, I promise I will see it. But my question is, are you working on another movie now? What is it about? And what is the next story that you wish to tell uh, to all of us? Yeah, so um, I'm doing yeah, uh, more films now. Um, and um, it's all about, uh, like, not what, what I've been through personally, but what Syria have been through in one way or another. There's one story about refugees uh, and another one about the detainees and their families. Um, what I'm just trying to do because I felt a little bit or maybe a lot lucky where my film went and the relationship I have now, the experience I gained through these years, I feel like I have more responsibility to do more films about Syria and try to bring like other also filmmakers and people who have stories and they want to tell it by their own like Selves. So maybe this is my main okay. hope now. We still have a room for one last question. We have the, thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan. Um, so I think it continues the previ previous question is to reduce that sense of guilt now that you live in, in London. And I'm sure this like displacement is, is similar. Uh, different people also experience this kind of feelings. What role do you think you have now being in London to try and tell the story of Syria in this case? Yeah, I think like there's two levels I really wanna like bring. One is really to be open and talk about this. Like with people like, like I think all of us here, it's as much as you can really be realistic and like bring these topics, like with your friends, with your family, with people you don't know, but you feel like this common kind of experience. Um, uh, this is one thing. The other thing is more like our work and what can we do from far away. Uh, sometimes I feel all of this like it's for nothing and it's not really doing anything. But another thing happened and you heard like something from someone you feel like I'm really doing a lot and it's really good to, do, to keep doing this stuff. Um, through Action for Summer we're, we're doing a lot of 
work and uh, we're just trying to kind of like make these memories of what happened in Syria alive again and again. Uh, the good moment and the beautiful moment, but also the horror and some crimes. Last month was the anniversary of uh, Al-Quds attack, when, um, where you can see in the film, in the middle of the film, there's a CCTV footage of a huge attack happened and over 53 people were killed. One of them was um, our friend, uh, a pediatric doctor, who was, um, who was the first doctor who checked Sama after she was born. Uh, he was killed in that attack. And what we try to do is to raise awareness about that attack again and do like kind of advocacy campaign between Ukraine, Syria, um, like the US, the UK, where doctors were wearing like masks and on the mask was written stop bombing hospitals. Um, just like, you know, as much as we can, some stuff is really like small and sometimes it's really big, but it's just keep trying and keep making the Syria like as much as we can like in, in, in any conversation. Thank you so much, Wad. I think we might have to close. I see another question, but we have to move to the next panel. But thank you so thank much, you so and please much. welcome me and thank, thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, Rad, once again. Um, before we move to the next panel, I'd kindly last ask to see the results of the poll for the past question, just to have an overview a little bit. I don't know whether these um, answers were influenced by the, <laughs> by the panel discussion before, but it's nice to have a look a little bit. And then maybe the answers as well to the present question. All right. Well, we'll okay. unpack that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, so now we are uh, delighted to start our panel discussion with four experts from the region in the field of education, peace building, and political economy. Um, while the region is plagued by prevailing sense of despair, the panelists' critical assessment, please join us, Maha. The panelists' critical assessment of the situation will allow us to draw a valuable lesson and inspire new possibilities for uh, the future. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Nisreen Salti, Dr. Karam Shaar, Dr. Maha Shoaib, and Mr. Bare Muhiddin. Please. Help, help yourself. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the speakers, please. Thank you. So. <laughs> you can you can switch if you want. Thank you. <laughs> All good. And before we start, I'll switch as well. <laughs> Sorry, right. it's fine. It's fine. All right, perfect. So, Nisreen, Dr. Nisreen Salti is an associate professor of economics at the American University of Beirut. She works on development economics and political economy. Her research is on inequality and inequity in resources, access, and outcomes, with a focus on health. She's especially interested in marginalized communities, particularly refugees, including their health and labor market outcomes. Karam Shaar, originally from Syria, Dr. Karam Shaar is an economist currently working as an independent consultant on Syria and is also the research director of the Operations and Policy Center. He is also a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and the Syria program manager at the Political and Economic Networks Observatory. His interests lie in Syria's political economy, fiscal and monetary economics, and international trade, and his writings on the subject have been published in the Middle East Institute, the Brookings Institution's Carnegie Middle East Center, and the Athletic Council. And we have also Dr. Maha Shoaib. Uh, Maha is the director of the Center for Lebanese Studies since 2012, and an associate lecturer at the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. She's a founding member and a former president of the Lebanese Association for History. She is also a co-founding member of the Disability Hub, a collective initiative that aims to promote research and advocacy around disability in the Arab world. Maha's research focuses on the sociology and politics of education, particularly equity and equality in education, and the implication of inequalities on marginalized groups such as refugee children and persons with disability. We, are, we also have Mr. Uh, Barak Mahaddin, who is a Jordanian independent policy analyst and whose most recent role was senior policy research specialist 
Four Generations for Peace. Um, before that, he worked as a senior researcher in the field of human security at the West Asia North Africa Institute. Barak's work focuses on peace building and conflict prevention through research and policy analysis. Um, in areas such as human security, youth opera operationalization, and preventing and countering violent extremism. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I would like to start this discussion by asking you a general question to say just a few words to start. Based on your area of expertise and in a few words, what is your opinion at the moment, the most pressing challenge and issue that the country is facing within your region? I can start with Ms. Reen. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you both uh, organizers for stellar organization so far. And thank you very much for um, the Rhodes and Said uh, scholarship for having us. Um, we're talking about a region where it's very difficult to pick one issue as the most pressing um, issue or crisis. Unfortunately, that is the case. And so at a regional level, my sense, the most pressing issue is the continued existence of an apartheid regime. Um, we heard this morning about the implications of that in terms of violations of human rights, continued colonialism violations of political rights, um, the um, use, expropriation of resources, of land, of natural resources. Now, if we want to talk about pressing challenges that policymakers within one of the countries that we're talking about can address, unlike apartheid, um, I would have to say, and this is probably very at odds with, the, with um, the, the poll, I would have to say it is youth emigration. Um, at least in the country I live and work in, which is Lebanon, there has been accelerated youth emigration. A lot of people will think this is because of the current economic crisis. It's actually been very, very alarming for years well before the crisis, so it's not a new phenomenon. And um, not just that, it is part of the economic model that is in place for the country. It's one of the pillar foundational aspects of this model. It's a model that's built on creating human capital at home, so educating the youth. And then instead of also creating opportunities for using that human capital at home, so jobs commensurate with the types of skills that the young people have, Pushing that human capital abroad as an expert, export per se, and um, hoping to get the funds back in the forms of um, remittances, of support. And instead, the jobs that are created in a, 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 an economy like Lebanon's economy is more jobs that are informal that uh, are in conditions that are barely decent with pay that is barely decent, and economies that are centered on consumption that's then financed by the human capital that we effectively export, and that this room is sort of full of. Um, so uh, this is a, a disastrous trend because it's one that if it continues, not only changes the demographics of society, but also changes, of course, the economic distribution because of the type of immigration. It changes, therefore, the social fabric, the political culture of the future of our society. So for me, that is the most pressing issue. Uh, for me, exactly as you said, I feel like where do you begin when you're talking about challenges in a region like, like ours? But if you think about, like, if you try to rank these challenges by um, your ability to actually instigate change, I feel that so, and what I mean actually by this first is, well, there are many things that need to be done. For example, uh, convincing uh, foreign policymakers to change their behavior towards the region. That's just not the lowest hanging fruit. That's not where we can focus uh, most of our efforts. But if I think of challenges where we actually need to do something, I would say the, the number one area we need to focus on is social cohesion. And this is not really just related to the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict or Palestine, Palestine versus Israel. This is actually happening across the region. Uh, you have, and it's actually very much expected uh, after this like period of upheaval uh, throughout the region. This splintering of, of um, views and, and beliefs, this uh, level of polarization is, is definitely expected. And if you think about people, say, in Syria, you feel that actually the 
we don't have much time left for us to bring Kurds and Arabs together. Uh, they're, they're clearly going in opposite directions. And if we do not sit and talk together and convince uh, each other that we will do better together uh, than uh, separate, I, I think um, the future is, is looking really, really ugly. And the same applies, I think, very much to, to Lebanon. You see people actually now talking about uh, multiple Lebanons, and obviously it applies to um, Israel and Palestine. Thank you. Uh, I guess we're going by order. Uh, I, I agree with what has been said, of course, uh, but for me, I would like to phrase it a bit differently. It's um, really, when I look at the region, it's not uh, the crisis we have. It's not one of, of politics or economics or social you know, uh, dimensions. These are all there. But I feel that the real crisis is that, or the challenge is that of leadership. Uh, and by that, I mean a crisis of decision-making. Uh, which could also translate into what we've saw in the in the in the results of the survey. It's, it's a governance issue. Uh, you know, when you have uh, people in charge who are basically and simply are not capable enough, not competent enough, not based on merits, then obviously you're going to see everything else falling apart. Whether it's the economic policy that pushes young people to leave the region, or the political policy that causes the lack of democracy and the lack of, of, of freedoms and, and all of it or the social policies. So I think the hard um, uh, core of it uh, all is really a matter of advancing those who are not fit and competent uh, at the expense of those who would be able to actually make a difference or change. The result of it, a byproduct of it, could be that those who are able to instigate the change that we all need and, and, and take the decisions that have been waiting for so long is that they would simply leave and take them elsewhere and, 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 and go elsewhere. So um, not, not to keep it uh, any more complicated, but this is really, for me, uh, the, the heart of, of, of the issue we have. Thank you. Dr. Omar. Um, first, I, would, I agree with Nasina. I would like to echo that apartheid is, is number one ticking bomb in the region that is it's going to constantly dis destabilize the whole area. And, and whatever we want to build, like if we had in Lebanon, at any minute, it can, be, it can collapse. Um, again, what to pick? I want to pick two things that are interrelated. One is uh, corruption or accountability. And I think this is a very important point, and this is a point where actually we can do something about it. If you take Lebanon, for example, it's a collapsing state that lives on aid and survives on aid. Jordan is a similar example. Many of the uh, neighboring regions are similar. But the um, degree of corruption and lack of integrity by the um, uh, aid community and the uh, government is just obscene. This is where I think we need to put more pressure for greater accountability and transparency. And, this, and I think we can do some of that because in Europe you have many regulations about transparency and accountability because you're paying tax. Um, but we don't mobilize some of these um, and we don't push and call for uh, uh, integrity. And, and, and the reason for that is I feel what it, making things worse is you have xenophobia spreading a lot in the global north. And you have obviously xenophobia in many of our governments that are racist and uh, uh, you know, don't, want to, don't want to welcome refugees. And they're exploiting the xenophobia of the global north to say, give us money, we'll keep the refugees here. But under what conditions are we keeping refugees uh, in Lebanon or Jordan or whatever? This, this for me, I feel like we can't let this just happen like this. In Lebanon, every year we're receiving billions of dollars that are not going anywhere. Where is it going? Why don't we hold our government accountable to this? And why don't we hold UNICEF, UNHCR, and all of these, and uh, you know, like EU, well, they have a, a pocket called donor committee. Why don't we uh, hold them accountable? The second point, and I'm gonna be very brief, what worries me a lot as well, is what, again, with youth, but Syrian refugees. They have been without proper education for the past 10 years. In Lebanon, just to give you some statistics, um, the statistics in 2019 in Lebanon, enrollment rate was supposedly 40 to 50 percent. Out of those 40 to 50 percent, 1 percent made it to grade 9. Can you imagine? So the, that means 200, 200 people out of 500,000 who are school age. So after spending all of these billions, we have only 200 who made it to grade 9. So you have a generation that had hardly any education. 50% never made it to any kind of schooling. So what will happen to this 
um, population of young people. What, and this is where I think we need to think of alternative models. We need to go outside the nation system, nationalistic educational systems, uh, and all of this, and think of alternatives. Even in the economy, I believe like the informal sector is going to be the solution rather than the formal. I will stop here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, that's actually a perfect transition to the question we have next. Corruption is a hot topic in the region, and it's a very often discussed and criticized. What is corruption? How do we define corruption? How does it change across regions? And how do we understand it? And Nisreen, Dr. Nisreen, in your, one of your papers, um, you touched about the topic of corruption in the economic, political, and social life. And you said that it was a widespread source of discontent uh, articulated in the Arab Spring. But you also found that public opinion towards corruption differs based on several factors. Could you explain why, in your opinion, uh, people perceive corrupt political and economic structures differently? And why are some complicit? And what can be done to make sure that people are conscious about the corrupt structures as well? Sure. So this is work based on public opinion polls that were run by Gallup. And this was from a while ago, but um, just before the Arab Spring, trying to unpack some of the grievances, the reasons for grievances among uh, populations across several countries of the region. And yes, we do find that people's attitudes towards corruption, their perception of corruption differs greatly depending on context, country, demographic, social uh, situation, etc. sector that we're talking about. Um, in, the, in, in many ways, that's not surprising. In many ways, it's very healthy because we think corruption does take very different forms in different aspects of life. Um, depending on which level of decision making is corrupt, depending on the depth of corruption. And it affects people very differently depending on where they stand and what type of receiving end they're on, what service we're talking about. But for us, it definitely is not an indication that people lack awareness or that people are complacent or, or complicit in corruption. I think it's more a reflection of the idea that corruption is a very broad rubric that encompasses all sorts of practices and behaviors that are very, very different from one context to the next. And it, it is an integral part of um, the determinants of outcomes that we care about, determinants of the, of the availability of education, of access to it, of um, the quality of education or healthcare or infrastructure or information. So it is clearly there. It's very rampant in the region. I think everybody is aware of that. What we need to start asking is why that is. Why is it rampant in the region? Why is it more rampant in the region than elsewhere? Rather than do we know that it's rampant? Um, and I think that it is, uh, there are more primal causes that we need to start thinking about. Things that lead to corruption rather than focusing so much on the fact that it's there and that it is widespread. Um, and so again, I'll bring this to the Lebanese example and this model of an economy that was in many ways designed with seeds of its own demise. And so in, for a lot of people observing the Lebanese economy, the collapse is not a surprise. It is a long time coming, in fact. It is that if you look at the structure of that economy, it is concentrating economic power and economic decision making in the hands of a very, very small elite. And it's been the case for decades. Um, and it's only gotten more and more consolidated in fewer and fewer hands. That leads to corruption. That creates a, a, a scene where corruption will become one of the ways to distribute, to allocate resources, to make decisions. And so, and so and that in many ways doesn't dwarf corruption or um, doesn't make it less important. It just is a more fundamental, more primal cause and one that um, I think uh, doesn't get as much attention and that if it is dealt with, will automatically limit parts of what we suffer from in terms of um, corruption, corrupt practices. Thank you very much. Talking about um, um, centralization of resources and you know, corruption and economy, um, Karam, several organizations have reported that Syria is becoming a narcotic state. I guess as well, a lot of the regional ones, I'm, I'm very curious to hear more. Um, as well, we're sure that many of the reasons are also economic corruption. From your work on this issue, could you tell us a bit more about the rise of the narcotics in the region and how they're currently contributing to the pressing challenge? Uh, I mean, I think um, 
the issue actually started in Lebanon before Syria, but it was never this rampant. Uh, over the previous uh, four or five years, uh, it just got out of control. And just to put the numbers in context, like when we're talking about a narco state, think of a single shipment that was seized in Salerno in Italy, which originated from Syria, which had a street value of a billion dollars. Uh, compare that with the Syrian national budget, which stood at that year at 2.7 billion. And so it's, it's absolutely a source that is basically funding uh, the um, groups running the region in there, primarily the al-Assad regime and the uh, people affiliated with it or organizations affiliated with it. So we're talking about uh, Bashar al-Assad, the fourth armed, uh, armored division, um, uh, Hezbollah, obviously, and um, in, in um, Lebanon you have it um, across the Bakar uh, Valley. Uh, basically. Now, I look at it as basically a byproduct of the conflict. It's not something that um, can be explained on its own. So Bashar al-Assad and, and his regime have been cornered, and they need to come up with a source of uh, funding for their operations. And to them, this is a very important live stream. Why am I saying this? Because it has very serious implications for how we deal with the problem. Uh, you can't just try to uh, create a working group uh, that, can, that consists of, say, neighboring states and try to um, make sure they're not importing these uh, chemical inputs used for producing uh, Captagon, the, the number one uh, drug produced there, because that's not going to work. You have to treat the, the underlying causes, and the underlying causes are that you do not have a political settlement uh, in Syria, and the al-Assad regime will always continue to, to rely on those uh, narcotics to, to fund itself, basically. Thank you so much, Karam. Um, actually, I would like to pick your point, uh, Nasreen, the brain drain, connect it with the corruption and take it to Maha, actually. Maha, um, corruption in a way or another is leading to brain drain. Of course, brain drain has a lot of other reasons, but corruption is, is one of them. And um, we have a lot of organizations here uh, who deliver, provide scholarship to, to people from the region um, to build this human capital that is needed to develop our region. And as I know that you're supportive of scholarship schemes, and, and same do I, but let me just play the, the devil advocate here. A lot of argument goes against these schemes that they exacerbate the brain drain. They lead actually to brain drain. They take people from their context, they take the practice, give them scholarships, we travel abroad, and they exacerbate this, this phenomena. Do you have a reflection on this? And I'll just to let you know, there are, we have Frania Sukkar here, we have Dr. Saeed, we have Yannick from Spark. All of them deliver international scholarships as well. Sure. Uh, I think the best investment in terms of development are scholarships, personally. Um, I don't believe brain drain is because of scholarship. I think it's the lack of opportunities in the region that makes people leave the country. So I'm all for scholarships, but I'm also, my only concern, and I think messages, you know, is that it can seem like an individual project, like a self-investment, uh, you know, just you're investing in one individual. And I think this is one of um, the things, it doesn't have to be this way. I think it's important to build the individual and to contribute youth and provide these opportunities because what is a scholarship? It's an opportunity to study. If I didn't have a scholarship personally, I wouldn't have been able to continue my education. Um, but I think one important thing is to remember what we do after we uh, build this experience. And I don't think going back to the uh, country of origin is the only way of contributing. I think we can make contributions anywhere around the world. And I think we have something to contribute around the world. There's a lot of, you know, like now it's uh, the um, common word is decolonization and, you know, uh, people from the global uh, south, uh, you know, uh, deconstructing some of the old colonial legacies in, in many fields. And I think we have a role to contribute globally. Our knowledge is not local, you know, we have to make uh, this contribution. But the one final point I also want to say, it's important that we also think about collective actions. And this is why I think what we often lack, if you want to pursue a career in academia or industry, often we're just working on our own and we're building our own uh, uh, legacy. I think there's a very important thing, which is that we have to connect with each other. We have to think of what other things we can create together in our fields. And this is why I think always joining you know, and creating whether associations or collectives is a very important thing to 
to create some kind of mobility and, and social movement, educational movement, political movement. Thank you. you can start it and we can follow the oh, Dr. Yes. Thank you so we much. We have already I, started a few. You're welcome to join. Thank you so much. I totally agree with you. Um, scholarships also changed my life and I believe also saved uh, my life. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's the best investment. People are leaving and leaving. These opportunities are giving people a different, a better hope. And they are also giving them skills that could contribute to rebuilding their country, which hopefully at a certain point, we will have the chance. Um, um, I'll pick on the same point with you, Barik, but, but, but from a different angle. Um, corruption, brain drain, and human security. Your area is human security, how this region can be secure. There is an argument that brain drain is good for security because when we leave the region, then the region will have less educated, less capable people to challenge the local governments and the local discourses. So by us leaving, then we will have less, less problems. Some people will call it homogenous society when we leave, yeah. and then the society will be homogenous. Yeah. What is your in, own take well, on this? I, is this, is this yeah, I, true? I, I clearly need to challenge the phrasing of your question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Having Please. been working in, in security. I think it does not lead to more security. It leads to more of the same, uh, more of the business as usual, more of maintaining the status quo. And that's from a government perspective, from a state perspective, from an authoritarian regime's perspective, that's one of the best things you could ask for, is, is really not to have those who want to change and who want to do things differently. Um, so that's definitely uh, true from the case of, of, of state, uh, from a state-centric perspective. Now, one of the biggest things that um, are, are, are important to note in this discussion, and just building on the point on corruption and on the education, is how you know, for, at least from, from the work that we've been uh, doing and, and the research that I've been part of, it's not what leads to corruption that concerns me the most, but rather what does corruption lead to? Um, so taking that cycle and, and, and completing it. Uh, one of the key things that are um, absolutely critical and, and, and we've been observing is that it leads to a sense of marginalization and to marginalization. When we looked at, and as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, a big part of the research I, I did was on violent extremism and terrorism and radicalization. One of the single most important kind of push factors was marginalization. And it's the same factor that also uh, triggered and instigated the uprisings in 2010 and 11. It was people's sense of, of humiliation, of being left out, of being not heard of. Uh, not heard about, uh, about, not heard from, that actually pushed them to the streets. And that puts, uh, or adds another notion that is interesting here, and that is the fact that when we speak of, of the Arab uprisings now and of the revolutionary change and of social movements, we tend to forget that this did not start or call for political change, but it was rather a social change. It was rather a call for dignity and, and, and human um, um, and social justice as long before it was democracy and, and, and regime change. So this is, I think, much more telling of the heart of the issue. Uh, but, and, and also to build on that uh, would be, I think, a big part of the answer for this session, which is how can we navigate a pivotal moment such as the one that, that we're living now. Um, it's, you know, we're seeing that greater securitization increase and increase and increase you know, from a decade uh, up until now. And in parallel to it, we're not seeing an investment in the human security notion. And, and, and for those who are not necessarily familiar or too familiar with the term, human security is basically reconceptualizing security to put the individual, the human, at the center of the security equation and not the state. Not preventing the state from, from physical harm. All of this is, is only one part of human security. And if we I think there are positive and, 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 help and promising indicators that more and more we, we're seeing security in that larger human um, lens and, and, and concept. And that, uh, I think, is, is, is something to build on. And we can expand on it maybe in the next questions or so. But, but really, it's, it's that shift from state-centric security to human-centric security is that is, provides kind of the best, uh, in my opinion, and the most promising a window of opportunity uh, in the so. region. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So we'll move to the, the second topic of this discussion, which is about inequalities. And with corruption, brain drain, a financial crisis, a post-COVID era, um, a refugee crisis, humanitarian crisis, inequalities have always been very big in the region. But now, more than ever, they're 
even bigger with the erasure of the middle class, for example, in Beirut with the financial crisis in Lebanon. Um, so, Nisreen, we're, we're wondering as well in, in your area of expertise, what do you think is the main driver of inequalities in Lebanon and also the region, potentially? So, as touching upon the Lebanese economic model in my response to earlier questions, which is one that ended up concentrating a lot of economic power and um, market power in the hands of very few individuals. But this has been the case for a very long time. In fact, since before independence, we heard this morning from uh, some of our panelists that there were monopolies set up very simply and handed over, well, initially to companies that were part of the colonial patron and then handed over to families or in partnership with families in Lebanon. So we've had a, a political economy that's been organized to restrict entry into specific markets and to privilege a class, to give a sort of un, um, unabated, really um, easy privilege to a class of uh, holders of licenses, holders of exclusive agencies that then can enjoy this overwhelming economic power in sectors that were essential. So essential goods and services, um, petrochemicals, uh, hydrocarbons, the import, it's the licenses to import these goods that for, for, you know, the markets for these goods were gonna be completely uh, secured for, for decades to come. But this was the case since before independence. And Lebanon has not always been a case of very high income polarization or income inequality. It's really only very recently that um, work from the Paris School of Economics, the group led by Thomas Piketty, that found that Lebanon is one of the most economically unequal places on the planet. So, you know, rivaling beacons of inequality like the United States or Brazil or even places that have structural components for inequality like South Africa. So Lebanon is more unequal than South Africa without a, a history of apartheid. So what happened, why did it, this, this structure that's been in place for you know, 70 years, why is it now suddenly led to such extreme polarization and income inequality? My sense is after the Civil War, this same um, business elite became enmeshed or in bed or married to new rising political actors that came into the political scene after the Civil War and that now, in addition to the market privileges this class had, in addition to access that was granted through exclusive agencies and import licenses and, and just domestic licensing, they now were putting the state to the use of this class. So now we had the apparatus of the state. We had fiscal policy and monetary policy that could be activated to further enrich those people with that economic clout, which were the business elites. So it's this marriage of these two very small classes um, and the overlap and the connections between them that then accelerated the inequality to unprecedented um, degrees that we now see today and that make us uh, a worse scene than South Africa that had to suffer a violent system of of structural inequality that we never had to go through because it's all been couched in these sort of market business alliances that, um, that don't seem on the uh, surface to be as, as brutal. Thank you. And as a result as well, I mean, Western countries have increasingly tried to support through the use of sanctions, which is a very traditional response to corruption. Um, so we're also curious to hear from Karim about um, the efficacy of these uh, policies and if there's any alternative model and are they actually hindering the situation, contributing to inequalities? What is to be done exactly? Because also the Western countries in general have also been criticized, for example, the World Bank um, for giving loans uh, without considering corruption as well. And at the moment before the election, they were increasingly giving loans as well. And, People, the, the, the citizens are saying we're already quite indebted, we don't have the capacity for a new loan, but what is the solution? What, what do you think as well is yeah, the move forward? I mean, I always tell my friends the easiest way to lose friends is to talk about either religions or sanctions. <laughs> There's such, such polarizing topics. I mean, you, you can almost never get two people to agree on, on sanctions. And actually, I think, I, I would first maybe challenge the, the assumption that sanctions are imposed as a response to corruption. Quite often they're actually imposed for political 
reasons. Uh, and you can feel that actually, so the most sanctioned country in the region is obviously Syria. And sanctions started from the 70s, but didn't really pick up until uh, the, the uprising uh, in March 2011. And you feel that sanctions there have actually gone through multiple stages. So they started initially as a tool for um, instigating change, behavioral change. So I go and sanction you and, and try to get you to change behavior. And that was basically the Syrian regime. They managed to achieve absolutely nothing with those sanctions. Uh, the, the regime did not budge an inch. Then later on, those sanctions became more of a, just a punitive tool. So you know what, you're clearly not gonna change behavior, I'm just gonna punish you for this uh, behavior. After that, years passed and you feel that we're actually now perhaps maybe in a third stage where sanctions are a lot more about just signaling tools or actually telling the people domestically, so in Western countries, that it's not true that we don't care about people dying uh, on the streets. We do, and we, we impose sanctions, actually. Uh, you tell your constituency that you care about them. And this is not really peculiar to Syria. I mean, it happens in, in Cuba, for example, just because of the domestic pressure of lobbyists, the Cuban uh, lobby in, in the States. And so I feel that now, like, with that in mind, I think we can talk a little bit about their like, impacts. You can see exactly, as you said, that the ones who are most affected by sanctions are basically civilians because the ones targeted are the ones who have the means to circumvent them. And here you're just thinking of primarily blanket sanctions, like targeting the financial system of a country. In that sense, obviously, the, the uh, kleptocratic elite are the ones who are able to have an alternative system for financing. It's Syrians uh, or, or Lebanese people abroad who are actually struggling because of sanctions. However, I wouldn't jump to conclusions too quickly and say that this actually applies to all sanctions. This is just part of the story. Uh, what about uh, asset freezes? What about uh, travel bans? These are good. Uh, uh, perhaps we need more of those sanctions. So I just think that sanctions need to be reformed fundamentally for them to work. And obviously the main challenge is Western politicians are using sanctions as uh, a tool. Uh, they should use it as a tool instead of using it as the tool, as the only tool. Obviously, currently, if you think of behavioral change, uh, you basically are trying to threaten the Syrian regime with a stick that is this big, and the Syrian regime is just a huge rock, you know? And you're saying, if you don't change behavior, I'll keep using this stick, it's just not, not gonna work. Thank you, thank you, Karam. Um, I would like to take the inequality uh, argument to you, um, Maha. Uh, Maha, in education, there is, uh, we, there is the way we look at education as a way for social mobility. We get education, we then find jobs, we get skilled, and we progress socially. So education is a, is a good uh, thing. However, and there is another argument that goes that education actually, this system, it's a, devising, a sorting device in the society. It devises people into different classes. If you go to private, you go to this class. If you're public, into that class. So there's a, a dark side to the education system in countries when it comes to inequality. From your understanding in the Lebanon context, can you, can you help us understand how this education system is contributing to all of these inequalities? Okay, let me start by giving an example. How many Lebanese are in the room? Okay. How many of you went to a public school? None. <laughs> None. None. It just tells you what happens. Children who go to public school don't make it to places like here. And probably in our parliament, I think there was one MP uh, who was uh, a graduate of a public school. And I don't think it's this round, it was the previous one. So basically, if you go to state schools, your chances are just next to nil. And this is, I only realized the extent of it when I started visiting some of the schools in the rural areas or even in urban areas like Tripoli, where children, some children have to, to work and study part time, you know, so they come to school three days a week or two days a week. And, and the principal has actually said it's okay because he wants them to come in and get any kind of education. So, but why, why do we have this kind of inequality? Why do 70% of students in Lebanon go to uh, 
private schools, even from very limited or low-income families. One of the reasons is, is what Nisreen spoke about, is the colonial legacy of how the whole regime has been set up. So in Lebanon, before independence, when we had the uh, uh, French mandate, they basically gave vouchers to schools, and this is how you, before there was a state system, you would use the voucher to go to the religious schools, mainly Catholic schools. Um, and this system continued till now. If you are a civil servant in Lebanon, if you're in the army or in the police, you also get a voucher to send your children to private schools. So there is a lack of faith in state schools. And uh, now, when you look at results, it's very interesting. When you look at, for instance, grade nine results in the official exams, there isn't a huge gap between the performance of students in state schools or private schools. But the reason also for that is many children drop out. But still, I think this is very good. These are very good results because private schools can ask your, you know, the less able, academically able students to go to another school so that they score high results. By the way, this happens also in England. You know, students who don't do very well academically in private schools will be asked to go to a less prominent private school. So, Inequality is on the rise everywhere. You know, your degree, the fact that you graduate from Cambridge or Oxford is going to affect your income significantly, is going to get you jobs, etc. So now what's the opposite of that is what you have, for instance, in Syria, where you, know, you only have a dominant public sector, very few people go to private schools, but then the quality can be questionable. So it's a difficult question because I, when I became a mom, it's, it all becomes it's like, okay, what do I do now? You know, uh, it's a very difficult, and then you feel like you are being a hypocrite about what choices you make. But then you want your son or child to make it. So, it's this is why I think it's number one in terms of the issues that should be on the agenda of any reform. Yet, here I want to talk about social cohesion. Many people in Lebanon don't talk about education inequality. You know what they talk about is how we can love each other. And that drives me nuts, because I think the problem is not love, you know, that I can't tolerate this person from a different sect. I think the problem is what opportunities do we have? Uh, you know, are, do we have equal opportunities or the fact because I'm a Shia or a Sunni or a Christian, I have different opportunities. So this is why I feel like, uh, and then the solution is, okay, let's have a national history textbook or a national citizenship and let's all drink from the same cup. It doesn't, so we've been learning the same civic education textbook for the past 20 years. We, I don't think we are a very cohesive society in terms of equality or et cetera. So this is why I think the diagnosis needs to change from this identity unification and that we all have to think and believe the same to economic uh, and class inequality. Thank you so much, Ma. So what I understood from you is at the age of six, seven, when people go to school, that's it. Their, their destiny is, is determined. It's Public, Even early chance. childhood, and this Even is the other early. issue, is many ch early childhood in Lebanon is not compulsory. Okay. So if you don't send your children, many people can't afford, and there are very few state schools for early childhood. Unfortunately. So, um, um, yeah. But if I move to you to the same um, argument, the inequality. Um, um, so basically, when the Arab Spring happened, a lot of voices were saying that this is um, a conspiracy and um, external factors are meddling with our region, which I believe to a certain degree could be true. We have a lot of external countries and, and forces that was meddling in our region. But to what degree do you think these inequalities contributed to where we are today in these five, six, seven regions that had these revolutions yeah. and failed Thank situation. you. Uh, I mean, the theory uh, that this is a conspiracy, obviously this, this took a, a very strong uh, resonance, I think, in the early years of the Arab uprisings. And in my opinion, I think this is the biggest insult to the people's agency on the ground, those who kind of rose to, 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 to change. And I don't think we would, uh, anybody would disagree that inequality has been a great contributor, one of the biggest factors why we had these revolutions and why we had these social movements uh, in, in the first place. Uh, but then again, it's, it's um, how did they play out that I think is, is much more telling of the inequalities or not of the situation uh, uh, improvement or not. And one of the things I would like to mention here in terms of inequality, uh, youth in the region, uh, you know, prior, closely prior to the uprisings, um, uh, were, were unequal, right? Where they suffered from this inequality. And I think one result of that was uh, that we started thinking about youth engagement 
uh, as, as something that does not exist. Uh, you know, those who were suppressed or oppressed or marginalized basically just did not have anything uh, to do with the public uh, affair or the public um, uh, you know, field uh, in general. Uh, now, what the revolutions have taught us uh, were, were so many things and challenged so many things. One of those is the myth of, of youth engagement. In my opinion, you know, the, the young person who, uh, men or women, who went down to Tahrir Square is just as engaged as the other person who picked up arms and went to join ISIS later on or Al-Qaeda just as much as engaged at the one who did not do, did not want to have anything to do with it and just focus on their education. Uh, the question I think that was facing all of us and still is, I think, is how can you ensure that there is a constructive engagement? Because at the end of the day, it seems that everybody is engaged. It's just in their own kind of way of, of engagement. So that's one. Two, and I think this is also really important to, to, to answering your question. Uh, when we speak of inequalities, we don't um, necessarily think of, uh, you know, the the, um, the impact that, uh, you know, that, uh, okay, how do I put this in a, in, a, in a diplomatic way? So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, expectations, right, and a lot of hopes that were really high in the beginning of the uprisings. Now, the, 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 the crushing of those hopes as they unfolded in different places and really did not turn out to be the, the, the positive, fruitful change that we want, uh, made um, the approach and the narrative and, and, and the thinking of young people uh, as a burden, as a problem, as an issue to, to be dealt with. And very quickly, they were no longer seen as a possibility and as an opportunity, as an economic um, opportunity or as an, 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 a social driver for change. And I feel that this, um, uh, radical and, 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 and very quick change in the perception and the narrative around people contribute to their, to their sense of inequality and to their sense of, of marginalization uh, in two, three years' time, uh, much, much, much bigger than what the regimes were doing in 10 and 15 years prior to the revolution. And, 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 I, and I feel that's where I think in the next uh, section we might want to really touch on the narrative around young people and how we describe them and how we see them and how uh, we see their role, because that uh, has seen, again, really radical shifts in the very, very early years of the uprisings, and I don't think we've actually managed to address, to address this uh, up until uh, this moment today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's, let's discuss that, actually. In public policy, there's often, um, you know, policies to address an issue, and yeah. in this circumstance, we're talking a lot about national identity, social cohesion, one against all, which... In our case, in, in the majority of the countries in the region, we haven't really had a chance to have because education has created a dispersed um, youth. Uh, people who go to private school have either gone to French, English, or Arabic universities, and that by default already sets the path for their trajectory later on, uh, whether they want to study in France or in the US or elsewhere. And there's a general misunderstanding as well in the region that um, you know, if people want change, why don't they change? But then there's also the whole backdrop of this disbursement, the diaspora, everyone left. Um, and also in Lebanon, at least, there's divisions in religions as well, in different classes as well, in classism, racism, all of these things. Um, so I would like to ask a general question to all of you as well. Do you think that the region is currently suffering from an identity crisis? And if so, if so, what are the main drivers um, and the consequences? And how do you think we can address it? Because it's a really complex issue. And I'll let Nisreen first answer. Okay. So, Easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so well, the economist answer always. Um, uh, it's a complex thing, right? Identities, and it's gonna come to the fore in particular moments and look like the overwhelming um, divisive issue, and then in other moments it won't be quite the centerpiece. And so the economic crisis in Lebanon, I feel, has really given us sort of a magnifying lens on the, on the horrors of the situation, on, the, on where there's a lot of toxicity, where there's a lot of gangrene, where there's, I think, you know, major pathologies. And, and what you do see is that sometimes when there is grave injustice, um, People coalesce around it from what we thought were extremely different identity groups, people with very little common culture or 
interest in general. And you see these movements created under duress and incredibly unfavorable conditions. So we now have unions of depositors. We've never had heard of such a thing. But there's a banking crisis that very quickly made people realize that they had that common interest and in, uh, shared that there was this grave injustice committed against them. And so they call us. And this is a segment of the population that is um, extremely diverse, right? So um, the deposits are very unequally distributed them too, just like the rest of resources in, in Lebanese society. And so most, the vast majority, the 80% of depositors are gonna be very small or medium depositors. And then there's a small minority of large depositors. But all of these came together and formed what now is the depositors union that's trying to secure the rights of this really um, sort of motley crew of, of people, all the, the only thing they had in common was the fact that they all had a bank account. That's all, right? So and, and it's and it's worked, and it's they've been um, they've been very vocal. They've tried to gain media time. They have tried to engage with um, other syndicates. They have been very vocal around elections, and that is a, a way that you find that identity divisions were unable to stand in the way of such mobilization. Uh, another example uh, that also comes to mind, other than this sort of um, union of depositors, are um, um, unions of retirees. And this does exist in a lot of other sort of Western economies, but we didn't used to have that. And now, again, because this is, as a class, is a class that suffered tremendously from the sudden decimation of the value of the currency. And these, this is a class that now is no longer able to recover because they're no longer in the labor force. So their life savings have been vanished. And so again, they got together. And again, they formed a, a, a committee, a, an entity that is able to lobby, engage, be asked, uh, try to mobilize, try to create actions or demand rights in ways that, again, we did not think necessarily possible. Uh, and this is across sects. This is across classes. This is across public and private. This is across regions of the country. And um, in the case of depositors, across age groups as well. And, and under circumstances that have, have made us all completely busy with with the basics of life. So really unable to have the bandwidth to organize and form unions and form syndicates. And so th in, in the face of this overwhelming pressure, they still have found the time and the hope right, to create such movements. I think for me, uh, tells me uh, there, might, there are definitely identity issues at play, but they're not the overwhelm, the deepest rifts, or they're not divisions that are impossible to overcome. It can only be overcome on the very slow, long term through investment at very, very early ages. These can be trumped by um, other issues that emerge because of structures that made other, uh, made these categories sort of um, somewhat secondary, and categories like income inequality much, much more prescient, much more visible. I mean, for me, I feel like, yeah, we come from a region that has always had an identity crisis. Uh, are we part of our own republics? Are we part of the kingdom? Are we part of the Ottoman Empire? And I think, like, we've always had this problem, even though, I mean, I think we can easily say that it has worsened recently. So you have now people living in um, so, say, the Palestinians who stayed in Israel and currently form 20% of uh, Israeli nationals, they do have an identity crisis that might be more severe than Syrians who live currently under uh, the regime control. But people in northwest Syria do have that problem far more than others they don't know. Are they part of Turkey or are they part of Syria currently? But I would actually echo what Nisreen said. I really don't think that this is actually the most pressing issue for us because identity, I mean, I, I would say for two reasons. First, we all have an identity crisis as human beings. I mean, I'm sure people here who, who are actually 
British who were born here do have an identity crisis. Who are we and where, where did I come from and where am I going after I die? I mean, at least I do have that identity crisis as a human being. But the second thing is identity is such a slow moving uh, notion. So it, it's not something that gets you riled up. It's not something that gets you really violent uh, and, and go and fight with others and create problems. So that's why I feel while it's important, it's definitely not one of the not, like, top uh, challenges the region is facing. Thank you. Maha, would you like to reflect on the identity topic? I would like to add identities because I think we have so many identities. Mm. I think what we are referring here more is the political or a kind of like uh, National nationalistic way. more. Um, and I think the, the problem is you have like in Lebanon the political regimes who are divided according to sectarian, uh, you know, uh, background. They they play on this the sectarian identity. So if you look at um, uh, the current minister of Basil, let's say, he would, in his speech, he's always talking about the Christians in Lebanon. So he's trying to stir it up. On the other hand, you have the Sunni, who's, you know, so in Lebanon, it has obviously become, you know, they are, but I also, it's interesting to see, like before 2005, it was a bit more, they were more polite about it. Now they just like say it openly. So after the civil war, we had kind of to put it under the table, but now it's out. But I think, so in terms of that national identity, I think it's there at any time it can be stirred up. Um, and I think what happened in the region is making it worse. So now in Lebanon or whatever, whenever you oppose, let's say, uh, pro Hezbollah uh, uh, groups, they would tell you, oh, if, if it wasn't for us, you would be wearing the veil now and you wouldn't be able to be here sitting and talking. So you do see that this is something that people try to use in many different ways. Um, but I think there are other identities that I think are also interesting. You know, the class identity, the uh, feminism, and I think this is something very positive to talk also about. Y young people trying to also break from the traditional way of looking at identities, trying to create these different collectives. And I think in some ways, I see that finally we have more diversity in our understanding of identities. And I think hopefully we're not going to go back to this kind of like one mono national identity being the most prominent thing. Thank you. I mean, it's hard to add after all this, uh, but the question of identity, um, at least for me personally, I would like to see it and analyze it and look at it through the social contract in the region. So if I want to see how the identities of individuals, especially young people, is, are, are changing, then I would want to maybe take a look at the social contract that used to be um, governing the, the region and how is this evolving and shifting at least in the past decade. And there are, I think, several ways to capture the way it's evolving. And, and I think it's telling of how the region's identity is changing. The first one, in my opinion, is when I compare it to my, for example, my parents' uh, generation and, and, and our generation. Uh, if I, you know, come um, to my dad with a problem, you know, a, a, or a public issue, you know, the first solution, the first proposal he would make would have to be one way or another linked to the government. Um, you know, he uh, or my mom or, you know, that generation sees the government as part of the solution. Now, in, in contrast, uh, if you speak to young people, uh, uh, and, and, and I can ask the question now, uh, and, and you'll see the answers, I think this generation sees the, the government as part of the problem, not the solution. And I think this is really a significant shift in the identity of those living in the region. Uh, because the question of problem solution leads to uh, another thing or another notion of, or question of expectation. So with what, what my dad would expect from the government or the public or the state is very different from what, what I would expect. Because again, I see it as part of the problem and not part of the solution. And part of my expect expectation today is really, um, for the government just to kind of get off the way and, and let me do things the way I want them to, uh, the way I, I, I have been educated, the way I have learned. Because if you look at the connectivity, at the exposure, at the educational level, all of these shifts and increases, I think, have made individuals in the region, young people in particular, men and women, uh, more um, independent in, in, in pursuing what they want. They're not waiting for a public sector job. 
they're, they're not waiting for a taqa'ud madani, you know, a social pension or a social, uh, you know, um, health care. Um, that, I feel, is the biggest, in my opinion, again, humble opinion, biggest shift in the mentality and in the identity of young people. And just one last uh, note on, on the education in particular and how this is really uh, important. Um, so in my father's generation, my parents' generation, they used to sell a piece of land so that we can go and study because everybody wants to see their daughter as a doctor or a mohandis or an engineer. This was uh, education in that sense, the academic education was really a simple of, of social status, of, of meaning, right? Uh, today, this is not so much the case. Uh, you're seeing an increase in at least young, peop young people's tendency and wish and desire to pursue technical education and vocational education because they realize that governments cannot deliver anymore any public sector jobs. And again, we see them as part of the problem, not the solution. So I'm not really waiting for that. And I don't have to be a doctor if I don't feel like it because I've been taught and learned through social media and connection and, 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 and all the exposure I have that I can think to myself and decide to myself. And it's not always that one kind of parent-guided or parent-inspired decision that I have to take for myself. So I think the results of, of, of these shifts, uh, and again, the way they're changing the, the social contract between the people and their governments is one of the biggest um, ways in which we can capture this identity question and, 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 and the way it's evolving. Thank you so much, uh, Bara. Um, I believe we still have five minutes to move to the Q&A section. So we have one question also, and we hope you can answer each in, in one minute. And we, we discussed and analyzed a lot of big things, inequality, corruption, sanctions, uh, education. Now we want to try to finish this panel with some hope and um, some optimism, optimism as well. So the question is really, how, how do you think we as this generation can, can influence the region in a positive way? And what, what, what could give us hope amidst this very difficult situation? So in the screen, I'll start from you. Um, okay. What gives me hope is Muhammad uh, Kirbi. What gives me hope is um, what gives me hope. Um, there was a editorial in the Harvard student newspaper. Um, was it ten days ago? Maybe two weeks ago? The Crimson, and it was unprecedented. Harvard students wrote the, the whole editorial board, signed by the editorial board, so it wasn't a single person, uh, wrote an article in solidarity with Palestine, um, talking about Har the need that Harvard divest from companies that support the Israeli Defense Forces, that support settlements. Um, that gives me hope. Somewhere, the problem which pushed our skilled, educated youth to, to the, the rest of the world the chickens have come home to roost. They've been active where they are. They've been contributing to the debate where they are. They've been changing mentalities where they are. They've been changing the discourse. They've been changing the narrative, which is, I guess, what this whole <laughs> conference is about, uh, where they are. And so, yes, we've pushed them away for economic reasons. We were hoping they would send money back home. That was part of our sort of defunct economic model that didn't produce much at home. It really imported most of the goods, and so we needed this foreign currency. Oh, well, look at what happens after generations of this happening, of these skilled, educated, smart, young people going abroad and engaging with their peers, we now have something that would have been unthinkable even five years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So there's that. That, that is hope. Locally, there's also hope. We, in, if this uh, event had happened a week ago, I wouldn't have had this to say, but in the end, the outcome of Lebanese elections uh, are, uh, the, the outcome is hopeful. Uh, the, we have a new form of political representation that is outside of the traditional ways of doing politics, that are parties that are not accountable to a specific sect, that are not running a show in a specific region. We have a party that's able to run mm -hmm. candidates in every single district, even though the districts were designed to make the sectarian parties succeed. And so even in though they're playing on a field that is a huge disadvantage to them, they're still able to break through. And again, they're able to do this with almost no resources, zero media time, in a state of absolute collapse. Um, that also gives me hope. Part of it is because we have 
now expat voting. So the Lebanese diaspora is able to vote, including those young people that are leaving the country, not necessarily happy to leave the country, but left with no other choice. And so when they voice their concerns, they have been concerns to get out of the system altogether, even though they're playing by the system's rules. And that is enormous. That speaks to me, speaks volumes. So that, that's my hopeful Thank you. Karam, you focus on policy, so you can do an elevator pitch in one minute to policymaker. Answer this in one minute. So basically, if we're thinking about it from like a policy perspective, we need to make sure what we're trying to achieve is first feasible. And obviously, this, uh, there's a spectrum. It's not a binary thing. So the, the level of effort that we need to put into it is something reasonable and something that adds value. So we rank what we want to do uh, in terms of like lowest hanging fruit versus the impossible. Uh, trying, like if, if we keep these two in mind, I would say I would think that the number one thing that we need to focus on is capacity building. That's, that is our, our number one priority. It's something that will take time, but something that yields the highest value. We can all say, let's go and influence foreign policy makers. Uh, they can uh, give us uh, a solution from a helicopter, but chances are they're not going to. Uh, it's our region. We have to work on it. And the number one priority should be capacity building, to my mind. Thank you so much. Uh, Maha, give us some hope. <laughs> Some hope. Well, there was an interesting talk in uh, Cambridge a few weeks ago about the left. And it seems what the left and the right can agree about is hope. We bo we, both of them acknowledge that we need hope. So at least that's a hopeful thing to start with. Um, personally, I feel there are a number of things to be hopeful about. Um, uh, I was able to vote for the first time in my life because in the previous election, we had to sue the government for lack of accessibility. This time, there were still violations, but there, there was more consideration about this, which shows that if you really keep pushing and pushing, there might be some change. I know political change is more difficult than kind of like a more softer issues about uh, other rights. Um, the Lebanese elections also are something to be hopeful about. I, I know one of the candidates who used to work at the center, she, she resigned because she wanted to run for the elections. And she was very reluctant. And I remember I said, uh, she, but she said, I want to try. I want to see how it goes. And she really got quite a lot. She was on the, one of the list who won uh, one seat. So I think there is hope if we don't give up and if we keep trying. But I think it shows us also the importance of mobilization, collective mobilization again, you know, Let's, and hopefully there will be hope. Thank you so much. There's also, uh, for me, at a very personal level, coming from a grassroots kind of, you know, work in civil society organization, I would see that, I say that the civil society uh, scene and, and, and activism that we see in the region is something that's very helpful. It's been managing, I think, quite very well to challenge governments and perceptions of policymakers. Uh, and uh, that is something that honestly gives me hope uh, in, in, in different ways. Uh, the apolitical activism that is emerging in the region is also something that I'm quite hopeful, uh, or hopeful about and, 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 and positive about. And by apolitical, I mean look at the environmentalists, look at the climate change activists, look at all these issues that for policymakers are not troubling or, you know, they do not cause a problem or an, an alarm or a concern because they're not politi politics or political. They're not about democracy. But by, I think, young people's engagement in all of these apolitical issues is teaching them how to engage, is teaching them how to lobby and how to advocate and how to, to, to be active. Uh, digital activism in venues is also another venue that uh, gives me a lot of hope. And um, the, again, the, uh, on an abstract note, the, the evolving social contract, again, uh, is something that I'm very hopeful and, and, and positive about because it is really uh, immense and, 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 and profound how we see our governments today and what we expect of them uh, as opposed to five or 10 and 15, 20 years ago. Um, so it's, it's, it's all good. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much. I think we've reached the end of this panel. We'll move to the Q&A. Um, it's been, I mean, I'm looking at the questions. We've received quite a lot of questions. Um, many of them were upvoted, uh, but also answered. So I'm not sure exactly if I should ask them, but I think we've touched upon um, the vital breakthrough that are needed uh, against the deadlocks in the regions and what can people do abroad. So I think, I hope that the answers that they just give would answer as well, mobilization, um, activism, and um, yeah, many, many other things that were discussed. 
Also, uh, we had, if you can change one policy in your country, what would it be and why? And I guess you kind of also answered it through capacity building and different sanctions and things like that. So I'm hoping we can also just um, skip that. But then the one I will ask uh, as a question is, um, in talking about corruption, uh, the failure of the public sector and the changing social contract, there is an implication that the individual can thrive through private sector. Are there long-term risks of casting government and the public sector as part of the problem that might inadvertently hinder change? I can reframe the question again if you want me to, but yeah, I hope that... Anyone would like to pick up on this question? I can. Since yeah. this is a social contract and, and the private and the public jobs and the, and the sector, uh, I don't think that's the case. Um, I would disagree that this might be um, a, a risk uh, for a simple reason, is that governments will not be able to continue to provide these jobs and, and, and these uh, opportunities, these economic opportunities. And the fact that more and more people and young people are going towards the private sector, not only mean or imply that they're working in companies in the private sector, but also we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of startups, a lot of new ideas and, 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 and uh, new uh, businesses and small and medium enterprises that are emerging and that are in the best way possible responding to global needs and to global markets need. Uh, the fact that we're seeing a lot of uh, increased connectivity means that you no longer have to uh, create and innovate in the field that is related only to your immediate geographical or physical surrounding, but rather you can respond to any challenge or idea uh, much, much, much further apart. So um, I, I, I think um, governments anyways, all across the world uh, are becoming um, minimal in the sense of, of them being able to provide uh, that kind of classical uh, services and classical uh, jobs and, 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 and what have you. And again, it's not only the private sector, but also the, the entrepreneurship and, and the innovative kind of new spaces, uh, digital and online and offline, that are um, being created. And that, I think, is not uh, risky in, or inherently uh, causes a risk uh, to, to public sector and to governments. That could lead to more inequality. And this is what we've seen in education, at least. And this is my concern. I worry about enterprise, and I worry about the concepts such as entrepreneurs, because you're seen as if you're left on your own to figure it out, and you have to be this special, you know, out of, you know, have to create an idea. And I, I don't think that's what we need to provide only. That might exist, but I think other models need to be. And I think we shouldn't look at the government or the state sector as if it's something static. I mean, who says that it cannot reform? Who says that it has to be a nine to five job? I mean, in Lebanon, it's nine to two. So maybe we can extend it. So, um, so you know, I, I don't, I think there could be, you know, it doesn't have to be either or, but I think there is a concern about more and more privatization. If we look at England, we looked at the cost of some of the bills of basic services, you know, since they've been privatized and how much we're paying now. So obviously they're leading to more inequality and, and it worries me that in the Arab world we are going in that direction. Thank you. Um, Ms. Reen, do you, as a political economist, do you have an uh, answer or reflection on this issue? Uh, um, I uh, sympathize with the concern <laughs> that, um, that um, uh, the government maybe is not an ideal employer, but um, it is a provider of services and that is part of the contract. That is part of what it means to be a citizen. Um, so there is that, and that, that I think, uh, so the, you know, so choosing private rather than public education as a um, solution uh, to our problems, I think, is ignoring the problem rather than finding a solution. Uh, so that, that's part of it. The other is that um, this faith that the market can be a good arbitrator is terrifying, frankly. So, so I think that the, there is another, there's a moral need also for, for for um, an elected body to be the arbitrator rather than um, necessarily the market. And so the more we cede to the pr private sector, um, I think we need to always be cognizant of, um, and, or wary of markets becoming arbitrators. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, do you want me to move to a question or would you like to reflect on this? 
I mean, yeah, just maybe very quickly, I think we have success stories like across the spectrum. You have uh, countries where the public sector is very big, say, such as Sweden, and the public sector did very, very well when it comes to service provision. You also have some other countries, say, like New Zealand, where I'm coming from. Uh, you have those reforms that were, um, like, a lot of public assets were also privatized. The, the public sector is far leaner, far smaller, and yet, I would say, even though prices have increased in some areas, obviously, I do not think it's contributed to inequality in the bad sense. It did increase inequality. However, everybody got richer as well. So it's also always, uh, like, it's about the balance between these two. That's, these are just my two cents. Thank you so much, Karim. I'm, I'm a strong believer of the private sector, but I agree with you that there should be a whole political, economic, social model, like, for example, the social democracy in Sweden, where the public and the private, they compete each other and they both do great job. And hopefully we can see such things in our regions. Um, there's, there's a question here, um, a point that we haven't touched on. Jamima, would you like, uh, should I ask the question? Uh, okay. Um, so n not one of you have cited water and food security as a pressing, pressing issue. This is happening now and will get worse later this year, early 2023, when the Ukraine harvest isn't collected. The socioeconomic and political implications are huge. Um, any idea why you, we haven't mentioned food and water security? But we can start. If I can just comment on this, because I think you're, you're absolutely right. And the drought that is actually hitting the region is one of the worst in like at least according to the EU in over 25 years, according to other sources in more than five decades. And so the drought is absolutely horrible. And if you think of the underlying drivers of why this is actually going to lead to more food insecurity, uh, I think those drivers are primarily about uh, the lack of infrastructure and bad planning and so on. And so, yeah, I think this is a very, very important point and uh, the, implica the implications are huge. So, yeah, I don't know why we didn't talk about it. Thank you. Should we take another question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Do you want to? so, Bashar Habib. Yeah, um, to, all, to all, all the problems that were mentioned are interconnected and complex. But what do you think is the one issue that could or should be solved first to start the required dominoes effect on the region? Do we need a new type of an Arab Spring? <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Bashar. I don't think that the, um, the Arab Spring we had has finished. I, in fact, I think, I think it's still in the very early stages. And if you look at revolutionary changes and movements all around the world, they take decades for them to materialize. Uh, so what we saw in the first two, three years, people thought it was over. I mean, really, we're just only starting. So in terms of what needs to happen or, you know, that what one thing that we should keep or, or do to stop that dominant effect, I think is to encourage, maintain, keep, push, and, and, and appreciate the activism, whether it's online or offline, that is happening. Because I think, I think this is really going to be the... the what's going to uphold you know, kinda the, 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 the spirit of the uprisings and keep it going. Look at Lebanon, Sudan, prior to COVID, uh, look at Egypt. Uh, I mean, everywhere you look, uh, it's quite clear for anybody who's ever been close to, to social movements and to theory of, of revolutions that this is really the beginning of, of, of uh, a cycle uh, you know, of, of change and, and counter change and revolution and counter revolution. I mean, the French took them 30 to 32 years, I think, until they got some sense of what democracy is or means, right? Uh, so in terms of revolutionary change, it's very cyclical and it's very long term. So I would uh, kind of say that we're still uh, beginning and, and we need to just keep uh, that in mind and keep pushing. Thank you, Karim. Anyone would like to comment on this before we move to another question? Okay, then I'll take this as to move to another question. Um, Karam, a question for you. You have shared earlier a graph that shows how Google searches of Syria have returned to the pre-2011 levels. So it seems like they increased and went back to the pre-2011 levels. Does, this decline, does the decline in international attention on Syria uh, affect how you approach your work? Do you worry about this for the coming years? I this think is this, from, isn't this is from Jad as well. Thank you, Jad. I think this is an excellent question. I mean, I, and, and this is basically the difference between people from the region who work on their region versus uh, Western pundits. And I have to be honest here, I think local 
uh, analysts are far more likely to stick to their area of expertise than uh, people who come from another region because they do it also partly for business because it's what people are talking about. It's what uh, policymakers domestically are talking about in Western countries. So for me, it really does not worry me. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm married to this cause. That's what I'm going to do. And I think I'm going to do it forever. Uh, but it is actually really worrying, uh, like for me, when I think about its implications. So if you think and there's overwhelming evidence that the level of attention uh, is strongly correlated with aid uh, provision. So when people in Western countries care less about what's happening in that specific country, that specific country gets, gets far less aid. Um, you see it with, the, with uh, like the decline in engagement, uh, policy engagement, political engagement from Western countries. This, I mean, I think currently the only tool of engagement that is being used and perhaps maybe it's not even engagement. The only policy tool that's being used towards at least Syria is basically sanctions. That said, they don't want to even talk to the Syrian regime, and that's absolutely not healthy. Uh, we know it's a criminal regime, but that's not uh, a way for us to, to resolve it. Yeah. Well, another question for you. Um, given that the state actors like the 4th Division of the Syrian Army and Hezbollah have embedded the narcotics industry in the political economy of Syria, and to a lesser extent of Lebanon, ideally, what are the steps that these two countries can take and the industries they can develop in the future so that they avoid the path dependency, dependencies that make their labor force depend on illegal industries? And that was from Marwan Safar. It's, it's very difficult, I think, for all countries that have such deeply entrenched networks that work in, in narcotics to, to, to change their business, just because the profit margin in those businesses is incredibly high. Once you actually enter that business, it'll take a lot of convincing for you to, to leave it, or just outright coercion. So you will have uh, an authority that basically prevents you from uh, engaging in that business. To be honest, I feel that the only way for us to, to move away from narcotics, and this is basically an ongoing disaster in, in the region, for us to move away from that, we will need to have uh, law enforcement agencies that act in the best interest of the people. We do not have those. We, we currently have countries that are run by the oppressors, people who benefit by taking advantage of our resources, by stealing our money. Once we get rid of them, perhaps things will be better. Thank you so much, Karam. We have two questions. Maybe we'll end them, one with uh, Maha and one with Nasreen as well. Um, Maha, corruption has been a culture. It's found in, an, in all levels in the region, even in relationships among people, combined with the weak education system. Fighting it become, become more difficult. From your point of view, how, how, would you, how can we change this? Uh, it was from Mohiba Kabud. From Mohiba, yes. Hmm, that's, uh, that's a difficult one. And it depends where do you, which level we want to start with. I would personally start, obviously, with the policy uh, level, and I would start with the main contributors to this uh, system. And here I want to pick up on the, uh, you know, the interest. So we had the other day a donor meeting, and many of the donors pulled out because they want to focus on Ukraine. And their answer was like, we've thrown so much money into the region, but you're so corrupt. But the fact that they are actually contributing to corruption and turning a blind eye, when we actually, uh, we did a study on that, and we asked them what kind of reporting and monitoring documentation you ask, uh, or do you request, there was hardly anything. Um, and even when they do their own self-evaluation, they don't publish that. Um, and, you know, personally, I have done a couple of consultancies. I no longer do that because you can't even publish the findings. You're not allowed to, to get them out. So I would start with the main funder of all the system that keeps corruption going on. There are also legislations. That's another important uh, issue. There's also capacity strengthening um, and creating accountability, transparency of data. Um, but also there are many legislations that I need. We did a survey of legislations in terms of education and corruption, and there are quite a few legislations that are, are lacking. In Lebanon, we didn't even have a, um, governments and ministries didn't even have to show the budgets of donations or grants or anything. So you can't even control and see what goes in the ministry and what goes out. There has been a new law that changed, and, uh, and this is why I think more of these changes are needed. Um, I would like also to listen to Barry, but Nasreen, um, uh, do you want to move to the next question? 
Let's move to the next question. To what extent collective action initiative with specific aims such as the depositor union help with social cohesion and equality? From uh, Ali Sayed. Um, thank you for that question. Let's, let's just before we start, sure. we have really two minutes sure. we need to close. Sure. So sure. we sure. also need to listen sure. to our audience. Sure. Um, I feel like um, most of these um, interest-based unions, mobilizations, definitely contribute to social cohesion. We have seen that very quickly come to fruition with positions or statements about the elections, the various players around the election with independent candidates seeking the approval or support of these new unions because there are unions that represent across sects, because they represent the interest of the losers of the system. Uh, of the political system that we're trying to um, upend here. So I, uh, clearly, uh, we've already seen that it does contribute to social cohesion, also because it, in, it groups people from so many different backgrounds in, um, in this activist and um, mobilizing and, and push for legislating uh, culture or ambiance. So having to work very closely together very frequently. Thank you so much. I really hope that one day we will, these things will make us put ideology behind and re 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 reunion us on a, on a bigger cause and just leave all of these ideologies. Do you have any final question to borrow? Or? I mean, there's one last question, uh, but not necessarily for Braddock. But um, so Tunis uh, who once was my economics professor at the American University of Beirut and one of the best. So my question is that you talked about young people leaving Lebanon and about the brain drain and loss of human capital. What do you think, in your opinion, the government or international organizations should do in order to keep these young, talented people in Lebanon from Luna Baalbeki? <laughs> Thank you for that question. There is a lot that can be done. We need to change our model. Our model is one that really was counting on the youth leaving because we needed the money that they would send back. And we needed it because we had a set of structures in place that encouraged that. Very, very briefly and very loosely speaking, when you fix your exchange rate, and this is gonna be an economics class, when you fix your exchange rate, you are basically penalizing producers locally if anything that's tradable. And anybody who produces any tradable good is at a disadvantage if you peg your, interest rate, your exchange rate to the dollar, which is what Lebanon did for 30 plus years. Um, you are basically disadvantaging your, disadvantaging your productive sector and therefore stopping jobs from being created locally. You're actively doing that. And so what are you gonna do with this educated youth? Well, they're gonna bring home the dollars that you need to keep the peg. So it's this really um, sort of self-defeating type of uh, uh, policy that was only maintained, and now we can go back to politics, it was only maintained because any time the system was close to failing because this is not an unsustainable formula, the international community would come in with aid, which brings us to what Maho is describing, to float us again. So it is an easy thing to dismantle. We need to imagine a different economy, but there are, different economies exist everywhere in the, in the world. We actively chose this one, and so we just need to unchoose it. Thank you, thank you. 30-second yeah. body, you, <laughs> any, anything you would like. Aya. Anything, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really positive, to be honest, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, the youthfulness, I think, of the region is something that we should all count on, and, uh, and the fact that we're just trying to do things differently is, is on its own, uh, I think, uh, a very hopeful note. And uh, yeah, I don't have much uh, more to Thank add. You so much. Thank solid. you. Then we will please join me in uh, thanking all of our uh, panelists and speakers for their great presentation. Um, I'm not sure about you, but I want uh, a coffee. And I'm sure a lot of people would like some coffee. So. We have like around 20 minutes, 25 max, so if you would like to make your way to that exception.